situation that we can raise our hands, that we can praise you, that we can magnify you, that we honor you again, Father God. We thank you, Father, for keeping us and blessing us. We thank you, Lord, for wrapping your arms around us one more time. We thank you, Father God, for being merciful to us, for giving us all that you have given us. We thank you, Father God, for not holding our sins against us for forgiving us, Father God, for messing up. And Lord, we realize that you are good and you are God all by yourself. Now, Lord, we come today, Father, asking you, Father God, to meet us at the place. We know you are all places at the same time. We realize, Father God, that everywhere you go, you bump into yourself. Now, Lord, we ask you to reveal yourself in this place. We pray, Father God, that you reveal yourself along the airways. We pray, Father God, that you bless in the name of Jesus as only you can. And Lord, we ask you to keep the glory. All the honor and all the praise allow us to be beneficiaries of your many blessings. This is the strong, mighty, powerful, and anointed name of Jesus Christ. We pray and we ask it all. Amen and thank God. Jesus, my blessed Savior, he is worthy. He is worthy. He is worthy. He is. He is worthy of all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise. He is God. He is God all by himself. He is worthy of all the honor and all the praise. And we come today to praise him, to lift him, to magnify him, that he will receive the glory, that he will receive the glory. We thank God for who he is and what he has already done. He is the awesome and the amazing God. He is. He is God. Hallelujah to the Lamb. We thank God for another privilege, another honor, another opportunity to come this way. We'll be looking at Ezra chapter 9 verse number 9. In the Old Testament the book is Ezra chapter 9 and verse number 9. 
Ezra, the old prophet of the old. Ezra, the priest. Ezra, the Bible reader. Ezra, chapter 9 and verse number 9. Ezra, chapter 9, verse number 9. Ezra, the book is Ezra. The chapter is 9 and the verse is number 9. When you found it, you will discover these words. For we were slaves, yet our God did not forsake us in our bondage. But he extended mercy to us in the sight of the kings of Persia to revive us, to repair the house of our God to rebuild its ruins and to give us a wall in Judah and Jerusalem. I want to talk about the God who will not forsake us. Amen. The God who will not forsake us. The God who will not forsake us. The God who will not forsake us. We, as the people of the days of old, we handle God like we handle our mask. We handle God. We deal with God like we deal with our mask. You know, there are several groups that have come to the conclusion that masks are not needed. So they wear no mask. Even though data has shown, even though uh, they have been told over and over again, even though the scientists and the doctors have declared that masks stop the, sp the spread, that masks build us up in such a way that we are able to avoid viruses and diseases. Right. You're right about it. You're right about it. And after over 500,000 people have died, All right. a new president of the United States come in and he he puts forth a demand to wear a mask. Yeah. And let me just share with you, if we had have been wearing masks when there was a different type of person mm -hmm. in office, mm -hmm. All right. we could have possibly saved a lot more. All right. All right. All right. Those of us who have, who have journeyed to the church today, we have masks. Amen. Amen. We have masks, we have our masks on because we realize that mass covers us. Yeah. All right. yeah. I want to tell you today that mass don't compare to God, but some of us right. treat our mass like we treat God. Ah, some people have concluded we don't really need God. And because we don't need God, we have come to the conclusion that we can do our own thing our own way. Then there are others who wear their mask, but they wear 50% of the mask. That's 50% of the mask. They, they have their mouths covered, but their nose are exposed. It's because they concluded that they ought to wear 50% of the mask. Okay. Let me tell you, there are some people who have come to the conclusion that they don't need God all the time. But they just need him 50% of the time. All right. And they treat God the way they treat their mouth. They they wear their mask 50% of the way. So they treat God like they wear their mask 50% of the time. All right. And then there are those who have the neck wearing mask. <laughs> they may as well not have a mask at all. <laughs> it's a nest breaks for them. It's a, it's a statement that I showed up with it on, now you get over it. That's how they treat God. They, they treat God. God, I am who I am. I woke up this morning on my own. I, I made my way to, to my job. I made my way among family and friends. And I, I showed up with your grace, but I really don't have your grace on. I don't really concern myself with thanking you for your grace because I just got up anyway. 
and they act like they were going to get up without God, and they act like they woke themselves up this morning. Therefore, they wear the neck mask. Then there are those who have what is known as the hanging mask. Everywhere they go, they got the mask on, but they got it on one ear, and it's just hanging. It, it's a hanging mask because sometimes they call on God when they want God to hang in there with them. It's a hanging mask, and they treat God like they treat their mask because they need God only when they're hanging on by a thread. When conditions are going down, but they, that's when they put God on. They have what is known as the hanging mask. Mm -hmm. right. And then there are those, there are those who have the mask fully on, but when they get ready to talk, they pull it down. <laughs> now, don't you know that if you have it on, and when you get ready to talk, that's when you really need it on. That's right. <laughs> because scientists says that 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 the Coronavirus and other viruses are spreaded because when you're talking, you're spewing droplets. Right. And so there are those who, who wear the mask, but, but when they get ready to get real close to you, sister, <laughs> they, they drop it down. And they tell you what they got to say. And when they back off you, they put it back on. That's why Sister Irvin wear five masks. That she wears one for her, she wears one for him, she wears one for her, she wears one for them, and if a dog come by, she got one on for him also. Because she understand there are some people who put no mask on when they want to talk to you. And then there are those who have the pull down mask. The pull down mask is when it's convenient. If they, if they can't breathe like they want to, they just pull it down. These people treat God the same way they treat their mask. God, I have pulled up with the boys now. I don't need you. Children oftentimes are working with God like they work with their pull down mask. Uh, Brother Nanlo, what they do, man, is that when the boys come around, they don't need God. But when they're down and out, they want to call on God. When something goes wrong, they want to call on God. But they pull their mask down because they don't want people to see them with the impression that they need God. So they pull away from God when other folk are clear with them. And then, you know, there are those who have the flip-flop mask. They will wear their mask one way. And then when they go around the other group, they wear their mask a different way. Right. Don't you know when you got the flip-flop mask, it means that the contamination on the outside yeah. is being turned over so you can suck it in on the inside. Yeah. But there are those who flip-flop on God. Mm -hmm. They are hallelujah on Sunday. <laughs> they celebrate God on Sunday. They love the Lord on Sunday. But the problem is on Monday through Saturday, they flip-flop on God. It's because they wear their mask that way. It's because they flip-flop with their mask and they contaminate themselves. Don't you know God says that you either hot or cold? If you look warm, I'll spew you out my mouth. So we have to stand for God even in the presence of other folk who don't stand. From God. All right, man. And finally, there are those who have a designer mask. Mm -hmm. They got a mask for every social club they're part of. Right. Even the New Beginning Church has a, has a designer mask. <laughs> it is a designer mask with NBC on it. All right. With the pastor's name and the website on the other side. <laughs> it's called a designer mask. It's, it's a mask that we want to let everybody know that we are with this group. The problem with those of us who have the designer mask, who treat God like we treat our mask, is that we're with our own posse, whatever our posse does. All right. We're with our friends, whatever our friends go through. Uh -huh. We're hanging out. These are the ride or die. Whether you're right or whether you're wrong, I'm going to ride or die with you. All right. It is called those who have on the designer mask. It is a designer mask. It's a designer mask that, that we live through. It's a designer mask that we walk with. And even in the church, we got on our designer mask. All right. 
And we treat our designer mask, we treat our mask like we treat our God. All right. It's a designer mask because we, we, we are able to identify with a certain group. And because we're able to identify with a certain group, we know we're somebody. And that same attitude has crept up in the church. That same attitude that I'm with this group and not with that group. I'm hanging out with this group and not with that group. It's because we treat our mass the same way we treat our God. All right. Now, come on, go with me again. There's, a, there's one who, who has no mass. They don't have any part of God. There's one who has the 50% mask, who wear their mask down below their nose, and, and they think that they've got a mask on. I hate going into a restaurant where the people who are fixing the food, they have masks on just so they can say they have one on. And they either have it on 50% that covers their mouth and not their nose. Or they have it up on their nose and have their mouth exposed. And then there's a group that wear the neck mask all the way down here and they talk to you. And, and Sister Irving just walks out and says, we can't, we can't meet here. We can't eat here. I mean, I mean, they, they, they talk with their mask around their neck. Then they have the hanging mask. The hanging mask. I'm going to hang in here till God see me through. I'm not going to approach God. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to allow God to deal with my stuff. I'm not going to allow God to deal with me. It's called the hanging mask. I'm going to just hang in here and I'm going to ride it out. But don't you know that you need God and you need his full covering? You need God every second, every hour, every minute, every, every month, every year. You need God every day. And then you know you got the one that talk that, that talk with the mask. They pull the mask down and talk to you. Then they put the mask back on. Let me tell you something, brother. Don't put it up, pull it off and talk to me. Take it off when you're by yourself. All right. Let me just share with you what they're doing is they want God to be there when they want him to be there so they can talk about anything and say anything. And to pull it down, man, those are the ones that pull it down in front of other folk because they don't want people to identify them with God. And the flip-flop mask is the one that talk, talks with it on one side and turn around and breathe in the contamination on the other side. Those are the ones that neither wet, neither hot or cold, wet or dry. They have, they have not decided whether they're going to walk with God or be blessed by God. And then you got the designer man that I'm a part of some group that you're not a part of. And praise the Lord that we got it going on and you don't have it going on. It's because I'm a part of a designer group. I want to say to you today in Ezra chapter 9, as well as in Lamentations, as well in Jeremiah, the Bible says that these people have wrong mark. They had come to the conclusion that they didn't need God anymore. They had walked away from him. They had, they had pulled their mask, their covering completely off. They had sinned. They had fallen short. They had married those who they should not have married. Look at how Jeremiah, look how uh, Ezra begins in chapter 9. He says, when these things were done, the, the, lead, the leaders came to me and said, Ezra is talking here, he said, the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the land. They have not separated themselves. God has called us as people of God to separate ourselves from those that are not with God. And it doesn't matter if it's your friend, if it's your dog, if it's your homeboy, if it's your girl. It doesn't matter who it is. You have to separate yourself from them. God warned them before they went over into Canaan land. When you get over there, don't get like them. And here it is in chapter 9. They have interracially married. Let me just pause right here and let you know that God has no problem with you marrying outside of your race. But the problem here is they not only married outside of their race, their race, they married to those who did not trust in God. God says that you should not be joined together with those who are unequally yoked. He said that you ought to make sure that if you love the Lord, they love the Lord. I say to every girl, every boy, I say to you today, whatever you do, you need to know his testimony of how he received Jesus Christ as Lord. 
If he or she have not received Jesus Christ as the Lord, tell them to give you 50 feet. If he or she has not given, I just dated myself, didn't I? If he or she has not trusted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, show them the hand. If he or she has not given their lives to Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and not walking with him and he is their Lord, you need to flee from them. All right. The text declares that they had gotten together and they have married folk that God warned them not to marry. Now, when you marry somebody, you all in. Uh -huh. When you marry somebody, you see them at their worst and at their best. Right. And many times you see more of the worst than you do the best. Many times you will come to a conclusion that when you see them, if, if they're worse, you will say, if I had a known. If I really had a known. If I really had a known. If I had a known, I was going to have to go through this. I would have kept on walking. All right. When he said, hey, little mama, where you going? I would have kept walking. <laughs> When she said, ooh, we man, I like how you walk. I, I like your voice. I, I like how you strut. I, I, I like your bow need. If you had known what she really was all about, you would have kept on walking. In the text, in the text, in the text, they were marrying among others. The key here is he married, they married those who were in abomination. Those who were not right with God. Those who didn't live for God. It was those that didn't have the covering of God. They married those in the land that, 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 that was from the Canaanite tribe. The Hittite tribe. The Pezzarite tribe. The Jezerite tribe. tribe the, the Moabite tribe. The, the Ammonite tribe. The Egyptian tribe. And the Moral tribe. The Amorites tribe. They just got excited about who they saw. And who they were with. They spend their time, and the truth of the matter is, there's no problem with spending your time with blacks or whites or, or yellows or brown. But the problem is when you integrate yourself in their world and they are not walking with God. And because of this, sin has entered into their lives. Sin has entered into their life. And the slogan goes like this. Sin will take you farther than you want to go. Right. Sin will make you stay longer than you want to stay. Yes, sir. And sin will make you pay more than you can afford to pay. Right. It's sin. Yes, I want to say to you today that sin not only creates a problem for you, but sin takes a toll on everybody around you. Everybody in the text, in the text, in, in, in Lamentations, uh, Brother Miles and Brother Whitlock have been doing an excellent job in making sure that, that we see Jeremiah for who he writes for. And we see Lamentations for what it stands. And we see Ezra for who he is. In the book of Lamentations, Jeremiah and in the book of Ezra, they have explained to us that there was a problem going on. I said there's a problem going on, that problem is sin. See, we can't look down our nose at anybody else because our sin is real too. Right. We can't judge the prostitute. We can't judge the dope dealer because your gossip is just as bad. Don't you know, don't you realize that regardless of what your sin is, regardless of how it looks, regardless of the color of it, you still guilty as charged. Just because you go to church on Sunday, just because you listen to the broadcast faithfully, and some people listen to six and seven broadcasts every Sunday. But what's happening between Sunday and Sunday? What's going on between Sunday and Sunday? What's showing up on Monday? What's going through on Tuesday? What's happening on Wednesday? What, how are you doing on Thursday? What's going through your head on Friday? And what's going through your life on Saturday? It's not enough to be holy on Sunday All right. All right. and be unholy the rest of the week. These folk had sin, and then they had the nerve, the audacity, the gall to look down on somebody else. It reminds me of the 21st century, how church folk will look down on someone who has changed their lifestyle or someone who has falling into pornography and they will look and scoff at them but when they get in their secret places, they're not always in their secret places before God. You can't look down on everybody else when your life is messed up too. 
a fellow said to me one time, a preacher said to me one time, he said, he said that, he said, he, he, he was looking at another man's sin. He was looking, you know, preachers fall short. Y'all do know that, don't you? You do know that preachers get caught up in stuff that they don't need to be caught up with, don't you? You don't. You do know that preachers trip and slip into stuff. You, you know that, don't you? So this brother said to me, after he had heard about a preacher that had got caught up in some mess, he said to me, am I the only one who's living righteous? Uh -oh. And I said to him, no, because you ain't living righteous. <laughs> Just that question alone. Just that and that thought alone just messed you up. If you were living righteous before you asked me that question, you just tore up your life. Very piously. As he pointed out somebody else's sin. Am I the only one who's living righteous? I said, Colonel, no. Absolutely no. No, you're not living righteous because you think you're more than who you are. You are nobody because God has blessed you. That's how you can even think the way you think. Right. Some of the people of the text, they were living their lives in sinful manners. And it had gotten to the point where Ezra got up and he began to fast and pray for them. And after he fasted and prayed for them, he bowed down on his knees. And when he fell to his knees, he spread his hands before the Lord. Let me just say to you, if anybody going to call on God for the people, it ought to be the preacher. If, if the people can't call on God, if the people can't bring themselves to call on God, the preacher ought to call on God before the people and on behalf of the people. He says to God, look how the preacher confessed. I'm in verse number, number five of Ezra chapter nine. He says, he said, Lord, I bow my knees before you. I raise my hand before you to the Lord my God. Verse number six, he says, oh my God, I am too ashamed. I am humiliated to even lift my face before you. My God, I am humiliated. I, I, am, I am ashamed to even lift my face before you. My God, I, I'm so ashamed because of the iniquity that has risen in the camp. I am ashamed because our sins and our iniquities have gone above our head. And let me tell you, when your sins get so great, until you're about to drown, drown them, you're in trouble. I want to say to you this day, don't wait till your sins get over your head to repent. Don't wait till your sins get over your head to call on God. No, don't wait till your sins almost to drown you that you tell God that I'm ashamed, Lord. Because he's ashamed because God will not be in the presence of sin. And he, he's ashamed to even bow his head and call on God. But let me tell you, whenever you're in a bad way, you better call on God. Whenever life is going down the too fast, you better stop calling him. Stop calling her. You better call on God. That's, that's why we have a pulpit. That's why we have a pulpit. The pulpit, the pulpit is designed that there are people sitting in the pit, and the pulpit is here so the word of God can pull you out of the pit. And that's why I sit in the audience a lot of times. That's why I go to go to other churches. That's why I go to revivals. That's why I go to conferences. Because I'm in the pit too. And every now and then, I need somebody in the pulpit to pull me out the pit. All right. Let me tell you, it's a pulpit. It's a pulpit They're designed to, to pull us out of the pit. He says, I am ashamed. I'm humiliated to even lift my face to you. My God, for our iniquity has risen higher than our heads. Our guilt has grown up to heaven. Our guilt has gone past our head, and now our guilt's a all the way up in heaven. God has seen our messed up situation. God has seen us put other stuff before him. God has seen us get to a point in our lives where we think we are somebody. The problem today is we think we are somebody. And because we think we are somebody, we have gotten to the point where we don't honor and obey God. And whenever we don't honor and obey God, then we think we are God ourselves. Thank God that we got some that can be humble. We got some that, can, that realize that I messed up. We got some who realize that I've fallen short. 
we got some that realize that I missed the mark. How many in here today have missed this mark? How many on the broadcast has missed the mark? And how many of you will, ex will accept the fact that you need God and you need him right now? Sin had run rampant. So much so until peace had left them. Sin had run rampant so much so until the young men don't meet in the county in this county square anymore. Right. Sin had run rampant until men walk off and leave their good families. Where women will walk off and leave their children. Sin had run rampant until the children no longer played in the street. Because of sin. I want to tell you today it's because of my sin. And because of your sin. That our world is what it is today. Little old Indianola, Mississippi. Population 9,000 people. At least when I was there, it was 12,000. Population 9,000 people. We drove up in town about 10 o'clock that morning. Left Mama's house about 10.30 that morning. Going down through the main street of town, police officers everywhere. So I go around the barricades, go to the post office, and the woman behind the desk can't even serve me. She's so distraught. Mm. No, no. She has a hand up to her head and, and she's weeping and she's crying. And she said, oh my God, I can't believe this has happened. Mm. And when I asked the question, what happened down the street? It says a guy, a robber or several robbers walked into this jewelry store. Mm. Took a gun and put it up to the female's owner's head and pulled the trigger and shot her in the head. Even though life flight came to the scene, life flight flew her into Jackson, Mississippi, she was reported dead. Let me just say to you today, when men can come to a point where they can take your life for nothing, when they can take your life for a piece of jewelry, when they can take your life for some money, let me tell you, sin is running rampant. When people can walk in a church and kill nine people and then the police put a bulletproof vest on him so nobody can harm him, sin is running rampant. Yeah. Yeah. When you can take a man who will take his knee and put it on another man's neck until he's unconscious, until he's dead, and then when the ambulance gets there, he's still kneeling on his knee. And then when the paramedic asks him to get up, and when the ambulance is all around, he still won't get up. Let me just share with you, sin is running rampant, my dears, but the good news today, when you look at verse number nine, there ought to be some good news. When we look at verse number nine, Ezra says, and, and Ezra nine, Ezra declares, for we were slain. You see what God did to the children of Israel and the children of Judah and the children of Jerusalem, what God did, he turned them over to their enemies. God turned them over. And let me tell you, what God has done to these great United States of America, he has turned them over to their enemies. Yeah, yeah. The sin is running rampant, and he has turned them over to their enemies. And in Leviticus chapter 3, I mean, Lamentation chapter 3 says it like this. The day has come when people, dead people, will be laying in the street like dawn and manure. And it, said, it goes on to say, and there will be nobody present to bury them. And we always thought that undertakers had good jobs because they had job security. <laughs> we thought that undertakers would always, always have jobs because people are dying every day. Yeah. Lamentation declares it like this, that there will be no one left to bury them. What he's saying is, even the undertaker would die in the street. Even the dead will die. They will be like manure in the field. Yeah, yeah. But the good news today, the good news is that while we were slaves, while God had, had let our enemies take us over, yeah. while we were in bondage, God did not forsake us. Yeah. I'm talking about the God who, who will not forsake us. He, yeah. he says, he says, Ezra says that when we were enslaved, when we were in bondage, God did not forsake us. Yeah, yeah. He stood with us. He's a merciful God, y'all. I came by to tell you, he's a merciful yeah. God. When we do things and we deserve death, he keeps us alive. Yeah. When we do things and we deserve a whooping, he doesn't give us a whooping. Yeah. 
He's a merciful God. When we do things and we act a certain kind of way, the God it has the right to release his, his wrath upon us, but he holds back judgment. He's a merciful God. I, I came to tell you, I don't deserve to stand here, but it's because of God's mercy. <laughs> it's because his mercy has kept me. I don't care how quiet you are. I don't care how holy you are. I don't care how long you've been a Christian. It's not because of your goodness. It's because of God's mercy. His mercy has found a way. His mercy. When justice should have pulled the line, when justice should have taken place, guess what God did? His mercy came right. His mercy came running. His mercy had delivered us. So he says, he says in verse number nine, he says, when we were slaves, yet our God did not forsake us. Even in our bondage, he didn't forsake us. He extended his mercy to us in the sight of our kings of Persia. And then he says, not only did he give us mercy, he revived us. This word revival means to bring us back to where we were. And beyond what we were. He, he revived us. He brought us back again. See what Jesus did on Calvary. He not only redeemed us. Not only did he bring us back. Not only did he buy us back. He also brought us back. He revived us. He, he revived us. He, he brought us back to where we were. And took us beyond that point. Then he says he repaired the house of our God. You see the enemies will try to tear down the house of God. The enemy will try to do anything in God's house. The enemy will try to destroy God's house. But God repaired, allowed them to repair. I told you last week that when, when, you, when you are building for the Lord, sometimes you have to have a weapon in one hand and, and, and prayer in the other heart. And, and then you have, a, you have building supplies in the other hand. I want to say to you this today. Don't take advice from those on the demolition crew <laughs> when you're trying to be on the construction crew that there are foes that there are foes uh, pastor Brian said it's not my original statement but what you have to understand is there will always be somebody on the deconstruction crew when you're working on the construction crew don't follow the advice, young people. When you see a person's life all torn up, messed up, don't follow the advice because guess what? Matter of two more seconds, your life will be torn up and messed up. Amen. He says, he says to us that God allowed them to build the house of God and rebuild the ruins. Rebuild the ruins. It was torn up. Let me tell you, our world is messed up terribly so. Our world is so messed up until folk have created this norm. Mm -hmm. People have accepted what we go through every day. Right. People have come to the conclusion that this is the norm now. And because it's the norm, everybody just get along with it. Mm -hmm. And I say to Congress today, if you want God to bless America, stop voting in sin. If you want God to bless America, stop voting in sin. The problem is, whether it's Democrat or Republic, it's still sin in the sight of God. You know, you're right. God allowed them to prepare the wall, and he gave them a wall in Judah and Jerusalem. God wants us to be able to sing a song again. He wants us to have peace again. He wants us to have encouragement again. God wants the children to run through the streets and pray, pray again. One, one, one person said to me, well, that was in the Bible days when they were stretched out in the field and, and they looked like the dong and it was as many of them as horse manure and cow manure. I said, baby, it's happening right now. Right now. Men, women, boys, and girls are dying in the street for no apparent reason because of some selfishness. But thank God for the good news. He hadn't forsaken us. I want to tell you to hang in there today. God has not forsaken us. Right. Don't give up. Don't give, don't give in. And don't give out. God has not forsaken us. Don't quit on God. Because God has not quit on you. Let me tell you how I know. Because he gave his very best for you. He gave his very best for you. He gave his very best for you over 2,000 years ago. He didn't quit on us. He saw this day coming. He did not quit on us. He did not forsake us. He gave his best. His son, Jesus Christ. He died for us over 2,000 years.
thousand years ago. He died. They killed him. Mean men killed him. They killed my Lord. They killed your God. They killed your Lord. He died on a skull hill called Calvary. Mean men killed him. The death, it was the death of an innocent man. They took him off the cross. Laid him in a borrowed tomb. It was a borrowed tomb because it didn't need it too long. It was a borrowed tomb because the text declares to us today that early that third day morning, he got up with all power. Early that third day morning, he got up with all strength. Early that third day morning, he got up with dunamis power. Dynamite power. Early that third day morning, he got up with the exclusive power. The authority and ability. He got up with it that early that third day morning. He died for us. He was buried for us. He rose for us. And now he's making intercession for us. God has not forsaken us. That same God who got up a dead Jesus, who rose up a dead Jesus. The word rose in the original Greek means to rouse. He roused him. He, and, and then it, it means to arouse, meaning that, that he got him up for your sins and my sins. And if you're here today, and if you're listening to me today, and you've never trusted Jesus as your personal Savior, you need to trust him today. You need to depend on him today. The door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. You ought to come to Jesus just as you are. If you've never trusted him, this is your moment. This is your opportunity. I know that sin is running rampant. But God has not forsaken us. Thank God that he has not forsaken us. And because he has not forsaken us, we're still able to make it. Because he has not forsaken us. never received him, this is your moment. Just bow your head and repeat after me and invite Jesus into your life. Say these words, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life. And make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and thank you. Receive Christ, and, but for some reason or the other, you struggle with sin. You've fallen short. You've messed up, as all of us have. You can repent right now. You can rededicate. You can recommit night right now. You can turn your life to the Lord and allow Him to be your Lord and your Savior. I want to pray with you, Lord Jesus. We ask you to bless those who are struggling, those who have fallen short who were messed up. We ask you to bless them now. Draw them by way of your Holy Spirit. Convict them to repent, to rededicate, to restructure their lives through you and you alone. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and thank God. And those of you who don't have a church home or in between church homes, this is your invitation. I pray that you can join the New Beginning Church. You will join the New Beginning Church, whether you are locally located or you are globally located. We welcome you to the New Beginning Church. Just inbox me and let me know that you want to be a part of the New Beginning Church. We will welcome you and celebrate you. And thank you so much for joining us. 
It is now offering time. It is now time to give unto the Lord. I say it's offering time. It's time to give to the Lord. It is time to give to the Lord. For those of you who are sitting in this room, you can get your envelopes at the very back. And uh, you can uh, give to the Lord. You can give the red and white envelopes as the pastor's love offering. White and blue envelopes are for tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. You can give to the Lord. Don't wait till next Sunday. Go ahead and give today. Don't let, wait till Wednesday. Go ahead and give today. If you're ready to give in this room, we will start on this side and we'll take one side at a time. We'll start on this side. We'll ask this side to stand. My left, your right. We'll ask this side to stand. Come on around from the rear to the front and give and give your offer. Come on around.
everything that's in him. Bless him, bless him, bless him. Bless his holy name. Bless his holy name. Hallelujah to the Lamb. As we've said, first Sunday, next first, next week, first Sunday, we will begin 1030 in our broadcast. Next week we will begin 1030 in our broadcast. 1030 meeting here in the building. We will be rejoicing and pr trust the Lord to do great things. At 10.30 a.m., we'll be moving back to our regular time before COVID hit. And I'll be glad, you'll be glad when COVID go back to hell where it came from. Amen? I know that's right. We'll be so glad when COVID decides to go back. We're praying every day that COVID go back where it came from. Amen? Uh, the former president said it came from China. I tell you, it came from hell. Amen? We wanted to go back to hell where it came from. Amen. We wanted to go back to hell. Our mission and vision statement, I'm sure it's been a year, but I'm sure you remember. Our mission and vision statement, come on, let's say it like we mean it. We are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus says, in our, if I be lifted up from the earth, we'll draw all men unto me. John 12 and 32. Father God, we thank you now. We bless your name. We thank you, God, that you have not forsaken us. We thank you that you have not forgotten us. We thank you that you're merciful to us. We thank you not only do you give us mercy, but you give us grace. And for that, we thank you. Now to him who is able to keep us from falling, Unto him, the only wise and only true God. Unto him be power, be glory, in dominion. Until we meet again, let us sing together. Amen. Amen. God bless you. God keep you. Amen. We want to welcome Sister Davis back to church. She's been skipping church for a long time now. So we want to welcome her back to church. She made sure that she didn't do a month. A month of, of being out, but she was right at a month. So we want to thank God for bringing her back. Amen. Thank you so much for, for being with us. You are dismissed.